The scripture that we're going to look at today is from actually two scriptures. One's from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 through 34. And one's from Matthew 22, 41 through 46. They're both following one another in Mark, but I like the way that Matthew puts it. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared ask him any more questions. The word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. Have you ever had one of those uh, really, really intense uh, religious conversations? Before I was a a Christian, uh, I would have these conversations with my friends all the time. We would uh, kind of get together and, uh, and figure out life's problems. We were going to solve the world's problems one question at a time. So we'd ask, uh, how do we know that God really exists? And we'd ask things like, uh, how do I even know that I exist? This is my hand, but I can see it, but what if it's not really there? You know, that type of thing. Because... Teenagers make two fundamental mistakes about themselves. First of all, they think they are the smartest people in the world. And then the second one is they think they are the most original in the world. So we would say things like, oh, you've got to write that down. People need to know. Nobody has thought of this ever. Uh, And I took that with me into college. And lo and behold, I became a a philosophy major. And I remember before I went into my first philosophy class, I was like, this is not going to be a problem, you know? I'm going to go in there, and I've heard all these questions before. Me and my friends, we are sharp, you know? We have debated this. We are ready. And luckily, when I went into my first class, there was some other person who asked their question, and they, they were just like me. They asked, they were like, well, have you ever thought about it this way to the teacher? And then the teacher systematically destroyed (laughs) this poor individual. And so I was, it was one of those moments where all the seats, you know, get pulled back. And uh, I realized I was so traumatized from that moment on that uh, for about a year and a half, I never asked a question. We've all had those conversations, those big conversations. And I think that's what this scripture today is. It's one of those big conversations. The only difference is is that this one really does matter. And it isn't between two overconfident teenagers. It's between this scribe, this teacher of the law, and Jesus. Now this scribe might have had some of my same problems. He might have thought he was a little too smart. But at the same time, he he may not have thought that he was very original. uh, Because it tells us in Matthew that he's asking this question in order to test Jesus. To see if he can trick Jesus. 
to maybe show his intelligence. But Jesus is Jesus. So for us to understand this scripture, we have to kind of get a little bit of context. Jesus has just come into Jerusalem. This is going to be the last week of his life. And he goes into the temple and he begins flipping over the tables and he's, he's uh, angry and upset because uh, these people have begun to abuse religion for profit. They've tried to take advantage of the poor. And so he flips over these tables and he begins to teach in the temple too. And so the Jewish leaders have this question, their first, very first question to Jesus that these priests and these teachers of the law and the elders have is this. By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you authority to do this? Now that's not a bad question. If somebody comes into here and they begin to flip over the, the, the chairs and they take Chad's guitar and smash it to pieces, you know, and then they get up on to this, this uh, stand and begin to teach us, one of our questions is going to be, who gave you the right to do this? Who sent you? Did James say you could come in here? <laughs> did uh, Pastor Sam? Did Josh? And it's the same thing here. But Jesus looks at him and he says, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you'll answer me one question. Was John's baptism, John the Baptist, was his baptism from heaven or was it from human origin? Now these leaders, they knew John the Baptist, he was famous, baptizing people, the man living out in the wilderness, but they just thought he was this crazy man. And so they get together and they're afraid because they can't really tell the people what they believe. And so Jesus says, well then neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. And then he tells this parable uh, that literally makes them look like villains and they decide at that point that they're going to find a way to get Jesus. They're going to find a way to kill him. And they get together and they say, we are smart men. We can figure this out. Let's trap him. If we get him to say the wrong thing in front of a bunch of people, it will probably lead to his death. Because people in that day and age, they would stone people for some of them saying the wrong things. So they begin to ask Jesus these questions. They ask him, should we give taxes to Caesar or not? It's a trap. The Sadducees ask him a question about marriage. This person married seven times, uh, and, and on the seventh time, if they die and they go to heaven, whose husband is this wife? It's a trap. It's to make him get into a bad position. And he answers them all in a way that he's not trapped, because once again, he's Jesus. And then this teacher of the law comes up, this scribe. He's the last one. And he asks him a question. So scribes were the legal experts in Jerusalem, in Judaism. The scribes were a group of Jewish leaders who, uh, uh, in the history's past, they would spend their time writing out the scriptures, transferring it from one thing to the next. But when Jerusalem is utterly destroyed, in 500 BC, and they're all taken to Babylon, these are the people who know the law well enough to continue to teach. So their authority starts rising. And, and out of them, there comes these great teachers uh, th where everybody respects them. If you think of uh, like Socrates or, or Plato, and their, their interpretations of the law become so authoritative that they're held at the same level with the law. And so that's what the scribes do. They would learn from these great teachers. A great teacher would come up, he would teach this, this uh, interpretation of the law, and he would have disciples who would surround him and sit by his feet. And they would listen to him, and then they would literally verbatim repeat exactly what he said back to them. I'm thankful it's not that way anymore have a terrible memory, uh, but they do it verbatim. And they're not allowed to say anything else, nothing, nothing you know, extemporaneously. So when, they, when these scribes teach the Jewish people, they teach two things. They teach the law, and they teach the interpretation that they learned from their teacher. 
but they don't teach as one who has authority. This is why when Jesus shows up on the scene and he's teaching everybody and he has this new teaching and he doesn't mention Rabbi Hillel or Rabbi Shammai or any of these great teachers, the people are amazed. They say he was teaching as one having authority and not as the scribes because the scribes were like parrots. They just repeated what they heard. And then then they said, what is this? A new teaching? And with authority? Is this a new teacher that we need to listen to? To replicate what he says? And the scribes knew the law backwards and forwards. They were lawyers. Now, I don't know if you've ever dealt with lawyers. If you're a lawyer, forgive me for what I'm about to say, okay? Uh, But before I was a pastor, I was an oil and gas land man. And so I, I have dealt with many lawyers. In fact, I think that we have a job as an oil and gas land man because lawyers complicate things. So the oil and gas company would come to us Uh, rather than go to a lawyer who would cost about $400 an hour, uh, and they would ask us, what does, does is this what the law says? And we'd say, yes, but that's not a legal opinion. You know, and we just give them an easy answer. Uh, Whereas a lawyer would give them, well, that depends. Exhibit A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. uh, And that would increase the hours and, and the outcome. So lawyers have a way of complicating things. Now they knew the law forwards and backwards. And you had to have them for certain things. You had to. Uh, And this is the same way with the scribe. The scribe knew the law forwards and backwards. And so he's coming up to Jesus and he says, I'm going to figure out this man's really a new teacher. Does he really know what he's talking about? Let's test him. Let's see what he he can do. So he asks him this question. What's the greatest commandment? Now, that's not a new question for them. I mean, these these are people of the law. They have been arguing about what is the greatest commandment for hundreds of years. They have 612 commandments. Some people said circumcision was the greatest commandment. If we don't do that, then we can't have the promise. If we don't have sacrificial system, then how are we going to ever go on with our sins still on us? They would have all these different answers. In fact, there was a tradition that about a hundred years before Christ, there were these two great teachers, these two rabbis, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai. Uh, I don't know if either one of those is the right way to pronounce it. Uh, But they were uh, sitting in an area, and this man comes up to them and asks them this question. He says, if you can teach me your religion while I jump on one foot, then I will become a Jew. And so Rabbi Shammai says, okay. And he goes over and he takes a yardstick and he begins to beat the man until the man (laughs) runs away, okay? But for some reason, this man decides to come back and he talks to Rabbi Hillel. Now, Rabbi Hillel is not as abusive a person as Rabbi Shammai, and he says, I'll I'll do it. And so he's jumping on his foot. And then he says this. He says, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor." That's the whole Torah, while the rest is commentary thereof. Go and learn. You see what he's saying? Essentially, love your neighbor as yourself. It's not a new question. And this scribe was testing this new authoritative teacher, Jesus. And Jesus responds not with one commandment, but with two. He says the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. It's the wisdom of Christ. Imagine if he had answered a little differently. What if he had said uh, the, the ritual cleaning laws were the most important? Well, we'd all probably be a whole lot more showered uh, in this world. Might have to be OCD to be a Christian. What if he had said something that's, that's good, like justice? Justice is what guides, guides the law. We'd all be Batman, you know? We'd do anything in our power to get the bad guy. No matter what, no mercy, 
know anything. Be Batman. But no, he says, love. Love God. And love neighbor. And we need to remember that when Jesus was asked for one commandment, He would not give one. He gave two. In the church, we always try and separate these two. We make a mistake every single time we do. If you only love God, your life turns into this selfish thing where you find what God has for you and you care nothing about the people that God Himself came for. And if you just love your neighbor and you never think about God at all, your love is going to fail you. You have to have a source for your love. Something that will give you strength in those times where you're not strong. Or else it'll just get to a point and you'll say, I give up. We need both. That's what he says here. Love God. Love your neighbor. And he doesn't just say love God a little. He says love Him with your whole heart. With all your emotion. But not just your heart. Not just your emotion, but love Him with your soul, which, which, which just means spirit. Love Him with your essence. Everything that you have. And not just your essence, but love Him with your mind. How often in Christianity do we hear, well, I don't need to know that. I'll just figure, you know, just keep it on faith. No, but we love God with our mind too. Shouldn't forget that. Then he says, love Him with your strength. With every bit of strength you have. And then he says, love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that tells us to do two things. First thing it tells us to do is to love our neighbor. The second thing it tells us to do is love ourselves. Now, we don't hear that a lot. Christianity has a way of saying, no, love your neighbor. Don't ever worry about your own self-interest. You don't matter. It's no concern about you. God cares about these other people, but not you. But we have to remember that Jesus Christ said that you must love yourself. Because it tells you how much to love your neighbor. Now, so for some of us, we don't ever have to hear that. Okay? We never have to hear love ourselves. That comes more naturally than anything else in the world. You know? Uh, me, I'm one of those people. I don't need to concentrate on that part. But there are people in this world who need to hear those words from Jesus. Who need to hear Him say, You must love yourself. You are valuable. You have worth. I love you. I died for you. It's from that place that you love others. There's no greater commandment than these two, he says. And then the scribe says, well said, teacher. You you have gotten it right. You have been tested and found adequate. And if I was Jesus, I'd be like, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your approval. Uh, and as lawyers go, you know how lawyers sometimes can be. He literally responds back to Jesus, verbatim what Jesus has just said, and in fact lengthens it. His response to Jesus is longer than Jesus' answer. So he says, you're right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And that's wisdom. But maybe he had a debate. Don't you kind of get the feeling that like, burnt offerings and sacrifices, we weren't talking about that. Maybe he was like, I had this other guy, he was telling me burnt offerings and sacrifices. <laughs> I see clearly now that I was right. It was love your God, love your neighbor. Uh, and then Jesus says this thing. He sees that he's answered wisely, it says. That this scribe is no longer trying to trick him or trap him, or kill him. 
but that he agrees with them. And so Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Now, if I'm the scribe, I'm responding, you're not far. I'm not far. We just agreed on the law. We got it right. Love your Lord, your God. With all. I'm, I'm with you. Not far. Why am I not in the kingdom of God? And he says, you're not far. You're wise, but you're missing something. And it tells us after this that nobody dared to ask Jesus another question. And then right after this, I love the way that Matthew records it. They've stopped their questions to Jesus. They've been trying to trap him all along. And Jesus has a question for them. He says, what do you think about the Messiah? That's the question he asks them. What do you think about this person who's supposed to save you? What do you think about this person who's told in, in Scripture that He will come and He will save all of Israel? What do you think about this Messiah? And it's kind of like He's saying, you thought long and hard about the law. You thought long and hard about the way you should act. And don't we get obsessed with that in religion, in Christianity? Don't we argue about that all the time? Well, if the people would just do A, B, C, or D, this whole world would be a better place. We would bring the kingdom here right now at this moment and everything would be solved. And isn't it the same thing that, that uh, all other religions do too? It's not just Christianity. Eastern religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Jainism, they all revolve around this word dharma. And it means different things to different people. But what it comes down to is how we act. Buddhism, it's the law and order of the universe. Hinduism, it's the right behavior. Sikhism, it's the paths of righteousness. Islam, it's obedience. And these things are important. Don't get me wrong. We need to know how to act. And Jesus just told us how to act. He just told the two great commandments to this, this scribe, and the scribe says, I'm with you. I got you. I'm there. Let's go on, you know? And Jesus says, you're close. You're this close. But you're not yet in the kingdom. And Jesus' first question to the people after this is, what do you think about the Messiah? Isn't that where we stand as Christians? What do you think about the Messiah? What do you think about Jesus Christ? Isn't that what separates us truly? He says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? They say, we know this. Ever since I was a little boy, I was taught in catechesis the right answer to this question. I have gone to church well, my whole life. I know the whole law backwards and forwards. I have seen the prophecies of the Messiah all along in the Old Testament, and it constantly tells us the right answer to this question. The right answer is A. It is the son of David. That's what they say. But you see, if the Messiah was only the son of David, his authority would be under a human. The Messiah would be the son of a human. And when the people say that Jesus never claimed to be God, this is what they're saying. It's that He was just the Son of a man. And when people say that Jesus uh, never was just one good teacher among many, this is what they're saying. That Jesus was the Son of a man. And the Jewish leaders thought the same thing. They said, you're the Son of David. You come under human authority. Nobody comes under divine authority because what would that do to our authority? It would take it away. And we're not ready for that. So when Jesus comes and He flips over all the tables in the temple and He says, you've made my father's house a den of robbers, He's really just talking about David. And when they ask Him, by what authority are you doing these things? He should have just said, I'm doing this by the authority of my father David because that's what they believed. There was only human authority. They did not believe that anybody would come 
and the authority of God. That's why when they ask Jesus, by what authority you're doing these things, and he, and he asks them, you tell me this question, was John's baptism from heaven or was it from earth? They can't answer. They get in this huddle and they say, okay, well, if we say from heaven, he's going to ask us this really good question, which would be, why didn't you listen to him? But if we say from, from man, the people who uh, believe that John comes from God will stone us. So they answered him, we don't know. Now not knowing is a fine answer if it's the truth. But this isn't the truth. They know. They believe that John was a charlatan. So Jesus says, neither will I tell you by what authority I come, because you just believe I was a charlatan. And in his first question to them, he's going to put it all to a rest. He says, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? And they reveal their hand. He's David's son. And then Jesus says, okay, well then how is it that David, speaking by the Spirit, by the power of God in his words, in other words, the ultimate truth, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to him, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? Now Jesus was quoting Psalm 110, and they all knew this. It was a messianic psalm where David is literally talking about God and he's talking about the Messiah. And he does not call the Messiah his son. He calls the Messiah Lord. And so Jesus is saying, how can your great king be the father of the Messiah if he is ready to kneel at his feet? And they have no answer. Because the Messiah does not come from the authority of humanity. He is the Son of God. And he doesn't come in the authority in any one of their great teachers of Rabbi Hillel or Shammai or Gamaliel or any of the other great teachers. He comes under the authority of God. Even David kneels to him. The reason the scribe was not very far from the kingdom of God and not in the kingdom of God was because his authority was the law. His authority was humanity. He was close. But he wasn't in it. Why? Because it's a kingdom. And a kingdom has to have what? A king. And the man had the king standing in front of him. And he never realized it. Until we come to that authority, and kneel, we will always be not far from the kingdom. Some will say, that's not fair. That's not fair. Jesus didn't make it clear. You have to know all this stuff about prophecies and about messiahs and about Jewish customs. I mean, who can figure that out? Why didn't he just say the words? And I would say to you, have you ever read this Gospel? In the very first chapter of Mark, he comes to the baptism of John the Baptist. He goes underneath the water. When he comes up, it says the heavens were ripped apart. The Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. And a voice comes from heaven that says, this is my Son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. And the moment after, he goes into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And Matthew tells us the temptation was always the same. If you are the Son of God, do A, B, or C. And for Jesus, this would have been a perfect time to say, well, I'm not. I'm just the Son of David. But that's not what he says. And then he spends his whole life chasing out demons who call him the Holy One of God, the Son of God. 
He commands the waves and the seas. He walks on water. He heals the lame, the blind, the sick. He raises the dead to life. And this is all before the cross. All before the resurrection of the dead. We don't have a place to stand if we say that Jesus didn't make it clear. He made it clear. Crystal clear. Even to this scribe. Maybe the scribe had no knowledge of all of that. He tells them this parable before and he says there was these, this uh, owner of a vineyard and he leaves the vineyard and he leaves it in control of the tenant farmers. And during harvest times, he sends back the people to get some of the harvest. He sends his servants and they take the servants and they beat them and they kill them and they send them away. And then he says, I'll send my son. They'll respect him. But what do they do? They kill him and they throw him out of the vineyard. And scripture tells us that every single one of those people understood who that story was about. And that's why they sought to kill him. Because they always understood the villain. But they never saw the hero. The son of God. The savior of the world. Jesus makes it plain. He is and always will be the Son of God. He doesn't come in the authority of humanity. He's not one great teacher among many like Hillel, Shammai, Gandhi, Buddha, Krishna, Muhammad. He is the King of kings. The Lord of lords. And until we are willing to acknowledge that, we will always be far from the kingdom. Will y'all say a prayer with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for having sent your Son. Father, it is not always easy for us to see him, to see what is as plain as day, to hear your voice that says, this is my Son. God, we pray that you may make it plain to our hearts, that we might accept this servant, That we might seek Him with our whole heart and and mind and strength and soul. Give us the strength, Lord, to kneel. Because we know that one day there will be no knee unbent. Help us to follow You now, God. Be with us in our day to day. Help us to glorify Your name and Your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus Christ's most blessed name. Amen.